welcome to our advanced training. I'm Lib Wild, the Vice President and Program Chair of our Master Gardener Group. Our title today is Simplify Your Life with Low Maintenance Succulents and Houseplants. And it's my pleasure to introduce Sandy Gibson, and she shares that she was raised by two horticulturalists, and they were never inside. She was always out in the garden, helping them plant and water. She went to school for something completely different and ended up working at a nursery while in college and never left the industry. She can just say that it's in her veins and after working over 10 years in the industry, she still loves it. So Sandy, it's all yours. All right, hi everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, I'm glad to be here and hopes to teach you guys something new about houseplants. It's been a wild ride for the last year and a half during COVID. Um, lots of people getting into houseplants more than ever. Um, geez, we were so busy at the garden center, just selling, selling, selling. I mean, I have not had a day off, I feel like, in the last two years because, you know, everybody's staying at home. They have nothing to do. And they're like, hey, why don't we get some houseplants and try this? So, of course, there's more to that story because, oh my gosh, it's really grown even online, you know, through people talking about plants and plant groups and selling plants on Facebook Market. So, you know, if you're really good at this, you can make a living somehow or just make some extra money on the side because people are propagating stuff selling stuff and it's it's pretty crazy it's hard to explain but anyways we're just going to go through you know all the house plants that I brought today I brought a pretty good selection and I'm going to start with all the low light plants so we're going to kind of go section by section low light plants first and then you guys can ask questions after you know that section of plants so first plant I'm talking about is this gorgeous aglonemia or Chinese evergreen. This plant's been around for a while. This one's got some really pretty colorful leaves. You know, aglonemias, Chinese evergreen have been mainly office plant for, gosh, 10, 20, 30 years. People have seen these with more silver foliage or green and silver foliage. But, you know, now as time rolls on, they've got lots of newer varieties with more white variegation, pink variegation, red variegations. And to me, I think probably one of the most low maintenance plants there is can go really dry in between waterings. And, you know, to keep the color, obviously need a little more light than most Chinese evergreens, if you're going to get one with pink or red or white, but just a super easy keeper. And Good one to try. So aglonemia, starting with the A's, and we're going to move on. Um, another plant that is very, very common, I know, and this one actually has a price tag on it. This is actually a ZZ plant. So we went from A to Z already, but I've got more to show you. This is a ZZ plant, but this is a unique one. This one's called uh, ZZ Zenzi because it's a dwarf variety of ZZ plant. So a lot of times when people come into the garden center and they say, I want to plant for no light, which, you know, we all know no plant likes no light. Every plant wants to see the sun a little bit because, you know, those are the two things that plants thrive on, sun and water. So usually I tell people, well, you know, there's plants that'll survive in that sort of bathroom with no window, but they're not going to thrive. So, you know, difference between surviving and thriving. ZZ plant is a plant that will actually survive in no light whatsoever. It's probably one of the only, lots of different varieties of Sansevieria. I actually planted this this morning and dropped it on my way <laughs> into the car. So, you know, it's got some really fun rock on the top, nice long a uh, planter that maybe you could put on a windowsill or in the middle of a table. And I even stuck some nice little geodes in there. You can't really tell, 
But this one's called Sansevieria starfish. And I know you guys can't super see it when I set it down, but it's just a really unique, fun plant. Um, my mom got one of these not too long ago because she's like, I really want something that's in the middle of my room, doesn't get, you know, direct sun. And I said, well, mom, try this Sansevieria starfish out. And she said, oh my gosh, this is just the coolest plant I've ever had. So, you know, a lot of times when people say, oh, I don't like mother-in-law's tongue. I don't really want one of those. I always like to say, okay, listen, they're NASA's number one air cleansing plant. They can take every single toxin out of the air more than any other plant does. You can water them once a month, just like the ZZ plant that I showed you. And I mean, there's so many different varieties. So you, you have your mindset on this one type of mother-in-law's tongue and I don't really like it. I've seen them a million times. Well, you know, there's a lot more varieties out there than just the usual. So Sansevieria starfish is one of my favorites. I think I have another one over here real quick that I'm gonna grab. This one here, it's so tiny, cute. Oh my gosh, so cute. Could go in a windowsill, grow super slow. You know, you could pot it in a pot and it could stay in that pot for a number of years. And this one's called sam Samurai. Really pokey ends of the leaves, but I mean, it's just different. Not something that you would think of as a low light house plant. So, you know, I know you guys wanted to know a little bit about some pet friendly plants too. Didn't really talk about that with the aglaonemia and the ZZ plant. Those two are not on the list. Along with the Sansevieria, these are not pet friendly. But I also like to stress, you know, I don't think that most animals are really gonna mess with this much. I mean, maybe a cat gnaws on it, gets a little, you know, I guess what they call just irritation in their mouth. You know, if they're ingesting it, eating it, yeah, that's a problem but hopefully you can squirt them with water or something in the meantime and try to train them to leave it alone. So Sansevieria, one of my favorites. Somebody actually called me Sandy Sansevieria once because I'm always selling this plant for some reason because it's just one of those, you know, when people come in and they're like, I kill everything. No, you can't kill this. Um, the next plant I'm going to move on to, like I said, still kind of staying in that lower light grouping, is the calatheas. Calatheas are a pet-friendly plant. This one that I just put up is Calathea lancifolia. Some people call it rattlesnake plant. I don't like to say rattlesnake plant because then when I do, people are like, ooh, I don't want it. And I'm like, okay, Calathea lancifolia is what it is. We're just not even going to call it rattlesnake plant. Um, I think it's a great plant. It's a plant with a personality because at night it stands up and you got this really pretty burgundy foliage that you see, kind of wild. And during the day it falls back down and open like that. Um, Calatheas have been super popular, especially on social media. So many different varieties, but I have to say that I was at a show, a plant show, and talking to a guy that grew calatheas. And I said, you know, people really like these things, but they are hard to grow. And he said, yes, they are. He said, you have to have filtered water. You have to fertilize them properly. Make sure they have the right amount of moisture at the right time, because if you don't, I don't know if anybody's had a maidenhair fern and been like, oh geez, I forgot to water that one time and now it's toast. Well, these can be really similar. So I did bring one of its cousins, so to say. This is a Calathea orbifolia, super popular plant on social media. People have pictures of these and they're, you know, a couple feet wide, beautiful plant, but boy, is it picky. So a lot of times when people are coming in saying, I want a low light plant, something that's easy to care for, you know, if there's something, somebody that I think can water more than a Sansevieria or ZZ plant and they're going to remember, okay, yeah, I could probably water this every other week, then I give them the Lancifolia because this one doesn't require the filtered water and is not as picky. 
as the other Calathea varieties. And of course there's tons of them. And I think we have probably at least, oh, 10 different kinds at the nursery, you know, and it kind of comes and goes, ebbs and flows on, you know, what's available. But, you know, if you want to try something that might be a little bit of a challenge, go right ahead, try one of these. Orbifolias, um, still staying in the low light category. I always recommend, and this is a tiny one, Dracaenas. I know everybody's probably owned a Dracaena in their life. You know, there's that Dracaena marginata, which has got the thin leaf, really thin leaf. Um, Dracaena marginatas need more light to really thrive, I find. Uh, my mom used to tell me a story that she, when she'd work in a greenhouse, she would play with the Dracaena marginatas. You know, they got the real long canes with the leaves coming out and they would move them. Um, they'd lay them on their side and they'd grow up and then they'd lay them on the other side and then they'd grow the other way. Just a fun little thing, kind of a something different that you'd never think of doing, but you see them all the time in nurseries braided and weaved and all sorts of different shapes. But this one is actually a Janet Craig compacta. So, you know, a lot of times people are coming in, I need something tall for the corner of a room, not a lot of light, Dracaenas, because we get them three foot, four foot, five foot, six foot, seven foot, I mean, whichever height you'd like. Lots of different variations. I like the Janet Craig compacta because it's got a really dark green leaf, green look to it. That's what I'm attracted to, but then we also have some others that have, you know, lemon, lime colors, the limelight. Um, but, you know, they all can do really low light, can go dry in between waterings. Not a plant that is pet friendly, but I feel like majority of the time, animals don't really mess with them. You know, the canes, if you get a really tall one, the canes are so high and then the foliage is at the top, nothing can really get to them. But you know, this is just a little tabletop guy. They grow super slow along with ZZ plant, Sansevieria. Majority of these plants just grow really slow, not gonna outgrow your space super quickly. Can go dry in between waterings, just like the ZZ plant and the Sansevieria can also. Okay, I'm gonna move on to something that is really, really popular right now, which is one of the first house plants I ever owned when I started working at Family Tree, which was 15 years ago, gosh. Um, it's the Swiss cheese plant, or, you know, there's a couple names that, there's a Monstera deliciosa, which is also a Swiss cheese plant, but this is the um, Monstera adisoni. Has the nice holes in the leaves, grows very similar to Apothos, or a philodendron. Super cute, really popular right now. Like I said, everybody's into these funky different plants, like with the holes in the leaves, which I think is really, really neat. And another thing that's super popular right now is, and this is why I wanted to bring this, is just putting things on a pole. So anything that is an aeroid, which most philodendrons fall into that category, where they have those aerial roots that come up. And I don't know if you can see them in here, but here's actually a root that is attaching to the pole. Kind of cool. So, I mean, really neat if you can get one of these things growing in your corner and get it really tall and just a different way of seeing it grow instead of seeing it trail everywhere or attached to a wall like we used to see people do. <laughs> one of my favorites, like I said, one of the very first houseplants I ever owned, it thrived in my apartment above my cabinets in my kitchen for months with very, very indirect light. Um, I didn't bring many pothos and philodendron, but this is another one that's super popular right now. This one is uh, just a philod it's a philodendron mycin. So kind of a dark, shiny leaf to it. Philodendron mycin. Um, a lot of times, I like to explain that there is a difference between philodendron and pothos. They are two different plants. You know, a lot of times you can tell that the philodendron have a little bit more of a heart-shaped leaf than the pothos, but you know, they're completely two different plants that grow similar, easy keepers. 
and super popular right now. People can propagate these easily, take the vines, start them in water, give them to your friends, family, whatever you want to do for Christmas. Um, but yeah, I mean, just really versatile plants. I also brought another type of philodendron since philodendrons are super popular right now. Oh my gosh, people are just going crazy over these things. And all the years that I've worked in a nursery, I never really thought that philodendrons would get this popular again. People always say, ew, philodendron, uh, it's just a philodendron. Well, now people are just like all into just all the different varieties and different kinds. As I don't know, most of us know about the pink princess. Everybody's going crazy over this pink princess, right? So there used to be a philodendron called pink, well, there still is a philodendron called pink princess, and it has dark leaves with pink variegation. Well, it's really popular and it's going for a lot of money online right now. We're going to get some. We've had some here and there, but I always like to tell people a funny story. I started at Family Tree a long time ago. You know, we're selling this plant and nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted it. We would buy them. We would mark them down. Couldn't get rid of them. And now everybody wants them. And they're so rare because all the growers decided hey, we're not making money off this plant. We're moving on to the next best thing. We got to make money. We're going to sell crotons like crazy and make money and things that are, you know, just a little more of a easy seller, I guess you would say. But I just think it's funny how, you know, things come back around and are popular again and it's pretty neat. So this is, this is a philodendron red um, emperor or imperial. And it's another one that's got the aerial roots. I know you probably can't see them, but definitely a prime candidate for growing up a nice pole in your corner. So lots of philodendrons, lots of pothos, options for lower light. Obviously, I say lower light, and I always tell people, even though it's lower light, doesn't mean that it doesn't want no light. Still wants some light, bright and direct. But majority of philodendrons and pothos are not pet friendly. So don't want your furry friends or reptiles munching on any of those. Um, moving on though, I have to say that this ponytail palm, pretty common. I'm sure most of you know about the ponytail palm. One of my favorite plants, pet friendly. Your cat would love to play with this and probably eat it and chew on it and all, on it, all of that. Um, I always like to bring the ponytail palm up because Man, I can really neglect this plant at my house. It is tough. It's really a slow grower. But man, when you see them, when they get big and you see that big trunk on them, elephant foot is another name. It's cool. I think it's a cool plant. And mine just kind of sits in the east window. It's not directly in the sun. I barely ever water it. And it does fine. Water it like every two, three weeks. Does great. Pet friendly. Ponytail palm, it's a cute one, nice looking one. And we got even smaller than this at the nursery that are nice little tabletop plant. Just makes me happy. So I think when it comes to low light things, that is about it. Um, another, I do like to bring up the bromeliads. I know a lot of people know about bromeliads, but I'd like to touch on them just because I think they're kind of underrated. I did do a little article on bromeliads in the Casey Gardner not too long ago. Um, they're just super durable and beautiful. People spend money on bouquets of flowers. Why wouldn't you spend money on a bromeliad to have a little pop of color in your house and you can let them go dry. You can kind of set them anywhere. You know, if they fade, you trim the bloom off. They'll have pups that you can propagate. Of course, those take a while to rebloom, but you know, if you are in the mood for an experiment and try and get them to rebloom again, the babies anyway, but the main plant won't ever reflower. Good plant. In that same family, I know that a lot of people probably know about Talansias, but in that same family of bromeliads, I had to bring him. <laughs> you can't really see him when I set him down, but I just thought this was so cool as a little astronaut pot and I stuck a little air plant in his head and of course brought other talansias here ones with had that have been tinted with some color which i don't mind 
some people do. But you know, these guys you can just toss in a sink of water, let them soak for about an hour, and then set them wherever you want. I've got them setting up in my kitchen window, but they can also do some lower light, lots of different kinds. Ionanthas, little guys, I don't know if you guys can see those very well, but they're a lot of fun. And one of my favorites, and these things can get much larger, is the largest Tillandsia ever, the Xerographica. But this is just a seedling, so it can grow. I think I've had one about this big around. But super cool, Tillandsias. Most of the silvery colored ones are more from deserty climates. So you think they need a lot of moisture, but they really don't. You can water them about once every other week and they're still fine. More the green varieties that have more of a green tint are gonna be more from climates that are a little more moist. So mainly South, South America, sometimes you can see them hanging in Florida and stuff, the moss and stuff hanging from the trees and these guys. I love the astronaut, super cute. Fun little planters we've got, so I had to show those off. So that's about it for the low light category. And if anybody has any questions, I am happy to answer them. I got, I got two questions here. So one of them is what is filtered water and does it hurt to cut air roots off of philodendron? So, oh my gosh, I love this story. I'm gonna answer the second one first because cutting the air roots off of philodendron is so weird. It's so, it, I don't even know, I get so nervous about this subject because when I was working at Family Tree a long time ago, I mean, when I first started, that we had this huge split leaf philodendron in the corner. I don't know if anybody's ever saw it. I don't know if you remember it, but the roots would come down from the pot, go down the stand and go down into the drain. It was trying to find water. It was creepy. It was so creepy. And I would rip them up and I'd cut them off and it never hurt, never hurt it at all. It just kept continuing to thrive. I mean, probably tried to grow a root elsewhere. Um, but I think if you're not trimming all of them off, the plant is completely fine. If you, um, you know, trim one here and there, no big deal. But man, those big split leaf philodendrons where the leaves can get, you know, a couple feet long, man, those air roots are crazy. And of course, when you go to Florida and certain places, you can see them climbing up trees and stuff, and it's pretty neat. Um, on the filtered water question, so a lot of times when people are coming in and we're kind of explaining, hey, like these plants like filtered water, they say, okay, so I could use distilled water. Yeah, you can use distilled water. You can use uh, reverse osmosis water. You can, you know, definitely use any kind of bottled water and that's fine. Um, every once in a while, I'll just boil water, let it sit back to room temperature, use that. And, you know, other than that, that's about it. You just don't want to use anything where you've got like a softener with salt or the mag, I guess it's magnesium. You know, some of those house plants can really build up a toxicity to the salt when it builds in the soil. You know, that's when you get the edge browning and, and certain things. And especially on, like I was saying, the Calathea, you'll notice that if you're watering this with tap water over a long period of time, you'll start to see the edges browning. And it could be from the chlorine and also the salt content in our water. We all know that we've got a ton of, you know, that because it builds up on the pots and everything and you can see it. So, you know, Every plant could use filtered water. It's just that certain ones are gonna be a little more sensitive to it than others. Peace lilies are another one. They'll get the edge, the ends of it browning. Um, is the mother-in-law's uh, tongue a dwarf or does it grow large? So the mother-in-law tongue that I had here, this one, the uh, starfish, it will grow pretty big. It's not gonna get huge, but you know, I've, I've seen them double in size, these guys. They can get pretty big. So the samurais, I have not seen them much bigger than about this. So once it gets that big, that's when they start to have babies and they're done. They're about at their max potential. That's the, that's the end of the questions. For the low light plants, we're gonna move on to the different, we'll say medium light. Um, I, I have to stress that 
I would think that majority of like the philodendrons and aglaonemias with the color, I would kind of consider a little more medium too, because like I was saying with some of the things with more color, I always tell people, you know, they're going to require more light if you want to keep that color. If you give them low light, they're going to tend to grow out and be more green. So pothos and philodendron, prime examples, you get a pothos that say a marble queen or a golden or a pearls and jade with the variegation. If you want that high variegation, you got to give them more light. So, you know, difference between surviving and thriving there again. Um, so we're going to move on to more like the medium. We'll just kind of say medium to highlight and I'll kind of go from medium to high if that works. I'm going to start with this little guy here. He is a peperomia. Peperomias have also been another plant that have been, you know, gaining more popularity recently. This is a peperomia frost, fun little flowers on it. Um, peperomia frost, and I also have a peperomia hope, which is a trailer and is also really popular, but it'll trail and it feels, both of them feel very succulent. -y. I don't know if anybody's ever had um, peperomias, but very similar to a succulent, like to go dry like a succulent. You can water them every couple of weeks, make sure that the soil is dry because if you don't, they can rot really easily. So peperomias, kind of fun, unique flowers, all sorts of different colors and textures. Ripple peperomias are probably one of the most common and you'll see the nice ripples in the leaves. This one has it, but there's some more that have a little bit more ripple. Actually, I think I brought another one that, I, yep, I did. Brought a couple different kinds. This one's real popular too, the peperomia watermelon. Obviously, everybody can tell it looks like a watermelon, but you know, just like I said, a, another plant that has been gaining popularity over the last couple of years and is just fun and different. And you can really easily propagate these things from a leaf, which I think is kind of cool. Um, sometimes you'll even see them when we get them in the pot in these pots, you'll see one leaf stuck down in the soil where they've started it. So a fun plant that you could try and propagate yourself. Peperomias. Peperomias, I do not believe are pet safe, but I do have a list. Oh, nope, they are. They're on the list. I made this list quite a while ago, so I can't remember everything that's on it sometimes, but peperomias. Um, another thing that is on the list are Hoyas. And I don't know if many people have seen the Hoya linearis, but very long, skinny leaves. I just think this is so neat. I don't think anybody's ever seen a Hoya like this. Does most people have ever had a Hoya? Okay, so Hoyas usually, a lot of times people remember the Hindu rope. It's a really curly Hoya that trails. They get start, They all the varieties get different flowers, but usually a star-shaped flower and very scented, but lots of different varieties of these gaining popularity again. I mean, I didn't know anything about this plant until a year ago. I've been doing house plants for 15 years. But, you know, if you're not a specialty grower and you're just shopping at, you know, I hate to say Lowe's, Home Depot, you know, box stores or your local garden center. I mean, we didn't really know about these types of plants until recently. They become popular, then the growers start to grow them again, which is kind of cool because you know, a lot of times you wouldn't find this plant unless you're shopping on eBay or something and you find somebody who's a specialty grower. So that's a Hoya. Very, these, these plants can do some medium light, but if you want them to bloom, you really want to give them some bright light. This is another one. I take mine outside every year and I think they do really well outside in morning sun. This is another one that, like I said, gaining popularity, Hoya obovata beautiful round leaves. It does have a little bit of like silvery variegation on the leaf, but when it trails and the leaves come out super cute and they just grow and grow to get like this massive size, which I think is so cool. And I don't know, Hoyas are just an easy keeper. They're not a plant that has to stay moist all the time. They're a plant that can go dry. Um, they're, I heard, Certain varieties, there is a rainy season where they're from. So 
you know, during the spring and summer, you start to pick up on the watering fertilization. And that's when you can get them to bloom. And then, of course, they trail like crazy. I do have a hard time with these in the wintertime. Got to have a lot of light. Um, you know, recently, we've gotten a lot better about having options on plant lights for indoors. Of course, I hate telling people to go to Amazon, but man, do they have an amazing selection of house plant lights that you can clip and do all sorts of things with. And I also brought, because I knew you guys were interested in pet friendly, and I feel like this is a plant that is definitely not a popular one. This is like, I don't want to say the redheaded stepchild of plants, but this poor guy, this false Aurelia, which I think is a, I think is a really neat plant, fun foliage. Um, it's just different and can go dry and can be a medium lighter, you know, and it's just beautiful as it grows. It can get, you know, four or five foot tall, super bushy, and it's just something fun and different. Aurelias can be picky, but this one's not really Aurelia. I can't even pronounce the <laughs> botanical name, but, you know, everybody can write this down, false Aurelia, look up the botanical name and have fun learning how to pronounce it because <laughs> it's not one of the easiest ones, I can tell you that. So brought the Aurelia, so I, I think it's a super cute guy. You know, we're just gonna keep going because I got lots of plants to show you guys, this is fun. Um, I did bring a fern because it's on the plant safe list or the pet friendly list. And this one is a, basically like a wax, they call it wax leaf fern. So sometimes you see this in floral arrangements, feels fake. So ferns are notorious for air cleansing. They're also just super great non-toxic plant. If you do let this fern go dry, this one's not going to crisp up on you super fast. It's one that can actually go a little on the drier side. But we carry so many different types of ferns for indoors. Anywhere you go, you, you know, you can find a good selection of maiden hairs, um, you know, stag horns, which I did bring a stag horn, all sorts of different kinds, and you can use them in so many different ways. I like to show people the stag horns on the plaques because I think this is one of my favorites. So most ferns do, I think it's kind of like contrary to, you know, everybody's belief that ferns don't need a lot of light because I find that when you do give them some medium to bright, they do a lot better. So, you know, sometimes people will come in and they say, oh, I need something for low light, maybe like a fern. And I'm like, yeah, you know, ferns just aren't the greatest for low light. They really thrive a lot better if they have more light. Um, like I say, in the maiden hairs, really hard one for people to keep alive, um, like to stay super moist. But I think a lot of times people just aren't giving them enough light to survive. And I think if they gave them a little more light, even stuck them in a shaded combo outside with your impatience, begonias, coleus, like that, stuff like that. If you have a lot of shade, they add a really fun texture. Um, and then you can rip them out, bring them inside for the winter time, try to overwinter them. Why not? Staghorn though, I do like to tell people that this is like one of my favorite plants. I think it's so cool. Um, I don't know if anybody had ever been down to David Bird's orchid caves before that unfortunate event happened, but he used to have massive ones on the walls. So cool. You know, when you go to Florida, sometimes every once in a while, you'll see this plant hanging in somebody's tree outside and it's just, you know, 10 feet wide in a basket that there's multiple and it's just so cool. This is actually a plant that falls in the epiphyte category along with bromeliads and air plants, the tillandsias. They don't really need soil to survive. They can just attach to something and grow and pretty dang cool. Plants are neat. So a little staghorn plaque that's got the hanger on the back. You know, you if you have a really fun bathroom with a window and tile, you know, you could get a 3M hook or, you know, and stick it to your tile and you could hang it in your shower. Super fun, but you know, it's got a little bit of sphagnum down in here and peat moss covered with burlap and really just want to keep this part moist. It can go dry, surprisingly, pretty dry, won't hurt it. 
but just a super fun plant. You'll start to see it grow out and attach with the sheath. It'll eventually just overcome the piece of wood and hang out on there, super fun. Staghorn fern, one of my favorites. Um, I'm gonna move to this fun alocasia dragon scale. Anybody tried alocasia's elephant ears? You know, super popular in your yard, but dang it, people are trying to grow these things inside. I think they're crazy because they love, or spider mites love them especially indoors, along with ivy. Did not bring any ivy because I don't believe in putting ivy inside, it gets spider mites. So this is a plant that people are trying to grow inside. This little thing here is in the four inch pot, costs $40. So alocasias are becoming super popular. There's more varieties out now than I've ever seen. Um, African face mask was one that was real popular for a while, still popular, I would think. Really fun, you know, another one to add to a shaded combo outside. And I think they grow really well outside, <laughs> but I don't know how in the world people are keeping these things alive inside. Surely lots of light and, you know, just keeping a close eye because man, like I said, ivy, um, alocasias, certain things, uh, Aurelia is another one you know, can have a common spider mite issue. And, you know, people a lot of times don't notice that issue until it's too far gone because they're so hard to see. So, you know, I always tell people really examine your plants up, you know, tops and bottoms of leaves every once in a while. If you see ever any speckling to the leaf, um, any edge yellowing, sometimes that can be caused by spider mites. No fun to get rid of they multiply so quickly that it's really hard to get a handle on them because they it's like every gosh every five days they can have babies and um gosh it's like i said really hard to to get rid of them so going on to a little bit of the higher light stuff i brought two really popular up and coming plants the ficus i know People are really used to the ficus burgundy, the rubber tree. This one's called ficus taniki. Beautiful white variegation. I brought this one because, man, it really caught my eye. All the white on the leaves, super beautiful. And this plant will get taller than me if you let it. But, you know, I always tell people when you get these little one stemmers, and I know it's really hard to cut them, but if you cut them, you can get them to branch out and do a little bit more like this guy here. This is another one. This is a ficus golden gem, which is another one that's just kind of up and coming in popularity. Ficus have really grown, you know, fiddly fig were really popular for a long time and people were just going crazy over fiddly fig because Johanna Gaines was using them in all of her designs inside. And uh, so we were selling fiddly figs like crazy. Well, now, People are so into variegated plants that, you know, they're starting to grow some more of these fun variegated ficus, which I'm like, wow, this is neat. So there is another one that's similar to this, the taniki called ruby. So a little more pink in the leaves. And then there's a green one that looks really similar to this golden gem, but not like a fiddly fig called Audrey. And it's kind of got a smaller leaf, really silvery kind of uh, velvety feeling on the leaf, but lots of new ficus, not just your normal ficus tree sitting in the corner anymore. There's, like I said, different colors, um, different types that, you know, ficus can be a little picky with moisture. They don't want to go really dry and they don't want to stay really wet. So I always think it's funny. People are saying, oh man, this ficus tree, they're dropping leaves everywhere. Well, we all know once you get it in a spot, don't move it, give it good light and don't ever move it again because it'll shed unless you're wanting to put it out on your patio or something for the summertime. But yeah, you move, you can't move them They're They can be picky that way. But you know, if, if they're shedding a lot, I feel like a lot of times people just aren't watering them enough. You know, they're shedding and dropping a bunch of brown crunchy leaves and probably cause they're not getting enough moisture. Um, this guy has a little bit, and the reason I brought it was because it had some browning on the edge. 
and some browning in the middle of the leaf. I always like to bring people problem children every once in a while so they know when you notice something like that, of course, it's starting at the lower leaves, not at the upper leaves, starting to pull the moisture out of these lower leaves because it got too dry at one point. More than likely, this pot needs to be repotted. And if I make a huge mess all over the floor, you can see the roots at the bottom and it could probably be repotted into a little bit bigger pot. That was one thing I did want to touch on. When you go and buy a tropical plant, I always tell people the first thing that you could do is pull the plant out of the pot and look at the roots. Some plants have been growing in the pot for a long time because if they're big, they've been, you know, sitting there trying to get big, growing a lot of roots and you get them and they're super root bound. They could use to be repotted. Some things don't really need it. Different root types, you know, you pull maybe this guy out of the pot and, you know, he, doesn't really have as many roots. You really can't even see them, it's all soil. So he could stay in this pot for probably another two years and would be fine, which I think is kind of crazy. You know, people don't really know when to repot just by picking this up and taking it home to their house. So, you know, I always tell people, the best thing that you can do is if you're wanting to repot it yourself, which I highly encourage because I think that's the fun part, but you know, a lot of people come into the garden center and get things potted for them all the time. But when I'm pulling things out of the pots, I always like to show people the roots. Like, hey, look at this. They're really bound up at the bottom, wound up like crazy. They need some room. And then other things don't. Um, I think what I'd like to do, and I know this sounds crazy, but I want to talk about <laughs> something that's super common. The African violet. Um... I picked this African violet and I hope you guys can see. I picked this one in general because it's got a really, really cute double flower with almost like a light um, edging around it. Lots of different colors of African violets, some variegated leaves. And the reason I like to talk about the African violet is it's kind of dear to my heart because my great grandma used to have these and they used to cross pollinate them. They used to take a little Q-tip and go from color to color and try to make different colors. And I just thought that was so neat. But, you know, I always thought this was just not a plant for me. And then I went to my mom's and I said, hey, you got that African violet over there and it's not looking too good. I think I need to take that home with me. I think I need to doctor it up a little bit. And she said, okay, go ahead, take it. So I took it home and I got this little shelf, wicker shelf, and it's got lights in it, every level. And I just stuck it at the bottom under a light. The light's like this close to it. And it just starts blooming its head off. My mom comes to my house a couple weeks later. What in the world? Is that the African violet that I gave you? I said, yeah, can you believe that? It has no outdoor light. It's just under a plant light going crazy. And she said, yeah, that, that's just so neat. And every once in a while, I haven't even repotted it. I just set it in a little saucer of water when it dries out and it sucks it right up. I mean, it's just the easiest thing and it blooms all the time, never stops blooming. And I do remember a long time ago talking to some guy that was in the oh um, African Violet Society. He said, best thing that you can do is not give them any outdoor light. Just put the light real close to them. I mean, the LED or whatever you've got and they'll be fine. So, you know, they don't like water in their leaves. They don't like to be touched on their leaves. Just bottom watered, you know, with some African violet fertilizer. You can find it anywhere. And I just think they're super rewarding in a plant that's just not as noticed as it should be. So had to had to bring that guy out. Um, another thing I want to talk about, well, actually, before I move on to the, the succulents and cactus category, I'd like to show you guys one other plant that has become pretty popular lately, um, the Chinese money plant. Funky, different, looks like a coin, Chinese money. This plant is so weird. So some people call it friendship plant. And if I pull it out of the pot, I don't know if you guys will be able to notice on the screen, but 
there's multiple pieces in this plant and it will also pop up little babies on the side of the pot. So they also call it friendship plant because you can easily just take a knife, cut the little sprout out, put it in a little pot of soil, give it to your friend, your neighbor, whoever you wanna give it to. But I just think it's really, really cute. I've seen them real, get real tall and the leaves can get quite large. Not super large, but really fun plant, Chinese money. Not something that you would have seen five years ago at a nursery. So it's just making a comeback. So now I'm gonna move on to succulents and cactus. I didn't bring a lot of cactus, but I did bring a little bit. I love succulents and cactus because I always tell people I water all day <laughs> at a nursery. And the last thing I wanna do is water my stuff when I get home. Those poor plants of mine, they get so neglected. And I just decided, I, you know, I'm attracted to the structures of the plants, the different colors, shapes. And I'm like, I think I'm gonna do this. I think I'm gonna do this succulent thing. So I started just collecting succulents. I've got too many plants and I'm not gonna tell you how many, but you know, this aloe, not an aloe vera, but I tell people, they come in and say, I really like succulents, but I kill everything. I kill all the succulents. Well, majority of the time, probably because you're not giving them enough light or you're watering it too much. But um, I feel like the aloe family is a really easy keeper. So if you want to try it, try it. But, you know, step out of the aloe vera boundary everybody needs an aloe vera right in case they burn themselves I actually love putting it in my hair which is crazy but if you put it in your hair and use it as a mask and then later wash your hair it makes it feel so healthy but this one here is called camille or carmen um it's you can't really tell in the light here but it can get some really pretty pink edging on it of course i always tell people you know, you see these amazing photos online of these succulents with this vibrant color. And it's usually a lot of times because it's either a lot of light or um, so a lot of sunlight or temperature. So if they get really cool at night, they can get the really vibrant colors. So here's two different types of aloe that I brought that I thought were pretty fun. One other reason I love aloe is because they always have tons of babies. So you can easily share this plant with a friend. I, my mom grows a lot of aloes and I'm always trying to steal hers. Thanks mom. I know I talk about my mom a lot. My dad is not around anymore, but my mother is and she still loves plants and we share a great passion together. And I think that as time rolls on and all these youngsters get more and more involved in plants, it's so fun to be able to talk to them about it and share things with them. You know, I, I think that sharing plants is one of the greatest things there is. I mean, I was telling the lady the other day that had a bunch of Shasta daisies in her yard. I said, hey, in the springtime, you know, when those Shasta daisies are just popping right up out of the ground, take a shovel, pop them out of there, give them to your neighbor, share them. Then they don't have to go buy a gallon pot for $10 or whatever it is. That's the beauty of perennials, but it's also the beauty of tropical plants is you get, this is a type of aloe also, a little type of aloe and a lot of times in the nursery they'll have more than one you can easily share that with a friend so you know you can go with your best friend of the nursery and say hey let's try some house plants and let's try to find some that have more than one in a pot <laughs> so they, they can go further um so the next grouping of succulents i like to talk about along with the aloes are haworthias and gasterias something that's not really commonly used a lot. I feel like I'm sure people have them or they get them and they just don't really know what they are. But these, this is a type of Haworthia. looks really similar to an aloe. Another one that propagates like crazy. Another Haworthia with a funky wider leaf. Some of them really clear in the light and you can take some really neat photos with the sun and like water droplets in them. Beautiful, beautiful. And they all propagate so easily. The zebra plant 
super popular. I know everybody's probably seen that one, but another one that has babies like crazy. And then the Gasterias. I only had one Gasteria, but I think these are so weird and funky, but super neat Gasterias. So any of these succulents, I mean, just something different to try. And these Haworthias and Gasterias, I think are pretty easy keepers. You can have them in a windowsill, give them bright light, you know, water them once a week, every other week, depending on how much sun they're getting and they'll do really well. You know, I brought, of course, a array of different succulents because like I said, I really, I really enjoy them, but I did bring some Echeverias because I know they're pet friendly and majority of succulents um, are pet friendly. I don't know what kind of pet is going to want to eat a succulent, but I know that reptiles and stuff sometimes will. Something just fell out of there. Um, but here's a cute little combo pot of succulents. You can go on your windowsill. Bright light, of course, um, can be watered when they're very dry. So I brought a couple different types of Echeverias. I do like to talk about Echeverias because people are so drawn to these plants because they look like a rose or like a flower. And when you put all different colors of Echeverias together, it's so pretty. Inside, they're hard. They're hard to keep alive. They do, and this is one thing I wanted to talk about and stress, is they have a different growth habit inside than they do outside. And there is a, a nice picture online of a succulent growth habit of low light and high light. So when you stick this in low light, it's gonna grow up and it's gonna reach for the light. It's not gonna look very good over time. People don't know what to do with them. What do I do with the succulent? It's so tall and it's really, really long. Well, the only thing you're gonna be able to do is chop the top off of it and completely restart it. And then you've got this big long stock. Well, what are you gonna do with it? Throw it away. Because the only thing that's gonna happen is eventually it will re-sprout. So if you wanna throw it somewhere in your yard or somewhere where you're not gonna really pay much attention to it, it could re-sprout and have babies. You could propagate, propagate those too, but they're not gonna look very good. So if you keep them outside, I think, they look amazing. They get real big. Some of them I've seen quite large, but if you keep them outside, give them a lot of light, they'll start to have more babies. You can propagate those, but the growth will be completely different and more colorful on the edges if you give them more light. So there's a, just a nice little combo of different succulents. Fun stuff. I did bring this guy. I just wanted to show him off because I just got these in the other day and I thought they were so fun. And of course, Halloween's coming up as a little skull with an array of succulents in it. So you can have some fun with succulents and we've got lots of little baby guys and you can make your own little combination or find a fun pot that you never used and shove some little baby succulents in there. I did bring some cactus. Cactus are, I think, also coming back in popularity. I mean, houseplants in general is just booming, but you see varieties that you haven't seen ever before. This one here I brought because when we got them in, I was like, I have to have one of those. I have lots of cactus. Um, I think they're super rewarding. I put them outside every year on my deck and they grow like crazy. Some of them bloom, some of them don't, but they don't take a lot of care. And there's so many different shapes, sizes um, that you could just have a million of them. And that's a problem, but not really. I mean, people what spend money on shoes, so spend money on plants. This one's called Roadkill, though. I thought this was super funny. Um, it's it's completely flat, like it got ran over by a car, but then it's like got the Mickey Mouse ears. It's a Puntia variety. So any of them that have the nice rounded leaves are in a Puntia variety. Super easy to propagate. You can literally just pick one of these off, stick it in dirt, and it'll grow. And it'll grow to be this size and no time. I mean, really, um, you know, if you get the big euphorbia type cactus that grow really tall, you see them grow six inches to a foot every year if they're outside getting lots of light, which I think is just super fun. And, you know, they don't take a lot of care. Um, another one that I think is really fun is this one called fishbone. It's a type of epiphyllum. And we've got quite a few types of epiphyllum cactus it will eventually start to trail, this cactus will, and it will trail really long and get really big, beautiful flowers. And 
parts of the United States, I think majority of California, I know these are really prominent in people's yards and stuff and they'll get huge and multiple flowers, multiple different colors. So, I mean, I love cactus. We have a night blooming cirrus at work that every once in a while we'll shoot off some really cool big white flowers that are, I guess, pollinated by a bat and its natural habitat, but just super fun, different shapes and sizes. Like I said, all my favorite things, especially this guy. I had to bring him because, and it's kind of hard to see on a white background, but um, old man. A lot of people know about the old man cactus, but I had to bring him because I just thought he was so cute in his little fluffy hair at the top. But, you know, I always tell people as bright a light as possible with these things in your house. I mean, no north window, east, south, or west, in the window, in the wintertime, ignore it. You know, and other than that, you can water them like once a month. They're outside. Let Mother Nature take care of them majority of the time. And they're fine. So I did bring a couple more things. There's palms are also super, super popular right now. Different types of palms. Majority of palms are pet friendly. So, you know, you can have a palm tree outside on your deck or your patio. If you've got a nice big window to bring it into, then you can easily overwinter a lot of palms. They're not going to look that great inside in the wintertime. Some will, some won't. I had a friend that really successfully overwintered a majesty palm, which is something you can buy for $20 in a south window last year. So, you know, you could try a palm. I think the main thing I like to stress to people is especially when it comes to palms or just any house plant, you're going to have it out on your patio and look like you're living somewhere else, not Kansas, because that's what my back patio looks like, an oasis, because I don't really go many places anymore. Not, I mean, only because of COVID, but I just enjoy my backyard. I love sitting back there, watching the birds and relaxing and having my oasis that I feel like could kind of be Florida, but it's really Kansas. Um, but, you know, you can easily overwinter a lot of this stuff just making sure, like I, I was going to say, is spraying them and treating them before you bring them inside. That's the biggest thing. You don't want to have a bug problem in the middle of winter and have to spray a pesticide in your house. You really want to make sure that that problem is taken care of before it happens. And I've got a couple of products I can show you guys, but I do um, have a strong love for this plant. So that was one of the reasons I brought it. And I think it's so funny because it's so tiny, but it has the most beautiful flower on it. This is a, a desert rose. And I started one of these long, long time ago. And it was about this size. And now it's about this size on the base. And mine had like over 50 blooms on it this year. This plant is so rewarding. In the wintertime, it looks like crap. It drops all of its leaves. It looks like a stem and a trunk, and that's about it. But man, when you put it outside, it's amazing how fast the leaves come back. And if you have it in hot, full sun, it will bloom quickly and a lot of blooms. And so, you know, look this plant up online. This one's called Desert Rose and see how amazing the trunks can get in Africa. This is where this plant is from. So, you know, I, I'm really attracted to plants from Africa, not only because they're super neat, but they're just super hardy. Like, oh my gosh, when does it rain in Africa? Barely ever. So, you know, you don't really have to care for this thing a lot. If you have to go on a work trip for a couple days, this thing can sit on your hot patio and is fine when you get back. The palms, that's another story. They might need a little more moisture than that and some of the other flowering things. But, you know, the cactus and succulents definitely could go outside and be kind of forgot about in a sense, which is kind of nice. So you still have green stuff outside on your, on your deck when you get home. So I did bring two products. Of course, we were talking about pest control. This one is just houseplant systemic granules. I'm sure a lot of people have seen this, use this. There's a dry measure on the back, depending on your pot size, tells you how much to use. Put it in your pot every two months. 
and it should usually take care of all the bugs that you have problems with. Fungus gnats can be a problem in the wintertime from overwatering. A lot of times it's what I tell people, you got fungus gnats, you're watering too much. Leave it alone. But you know what? Nine times out of 10, we're over caring for things anyway, because that's our nature. We want it to survive and we want it to thrive and you know, oh, a little extra water won't hurt. Yeah, sometimes it will. And then you have little bugs flying around and that's not fun. So I always like to explain to people, soil is not sterile. Anytime you keep soil wet for a long period of time, things are gonna grow. And the systemic granules can help that. Um, some people use mosquito bits. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of mosquito bits, but that's another thing that you can shake in the top of your soil for fungus gnat issues. But this one is drawn up through the system of the plant. So anything that's also feeding on the plant, you know, thrips, spider mites, you know, mealy bug, ugh, mealy bug. You see a mealy bug, I don't know what to say. Throw the plant away. I don't even know what to do, use anymore. Nothing kills them, but this will help the systemic granules. Um, it's a systemic houseplant granules. Comes in all different sizes. So if you have bigger plants, get a bigger, size of those because it'll take quite a bit. Sometimes it'll, if it's a pretty large pot, you can call for like a cup of it. So that can almost use the whole bottle that's this size. You'll need to have a bigger bottle. Um, this is another product that I think is a decently good product to use. Um, Captain Jack's Dead Bug. It's spinosad and it labels quite a few insects. There's another Obviously, a couple products from Bonide. Eight is another one that you can spray on houseplants. But this Captain Jack's is certified organic, I believe, or it says for organic gardening. So I feel like people tend to like to use this, feel a little bit safer using this than other things. But, you know, I always tell people, if you grab something like this, you know, it's okay if you just have a couple plants to use something like this, but you're going to be spraying, 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 and you're arm is going to hurt. So we sell these bottles and everybody sells these bottles now in a hose end. So if you have multiple plants that you're bringing in at the end of the year, big palms and a lot of plants, sometimes it's good to get the hose in because it's so easy and you're just spraying, takes you five minutes, everything's done. Where if you use something like this, it'd take you half a night to spray everything, tops and bottoms of leaves. Sometimes I even tell people spray inside the rim of the pot. Always check the rims of the pots because that's where mealybugs like to live and lay their eggs. So, you know, I do like to talk about pest control quite a bit because I feel like there's so many different bugs out there. And as time rolls on, um, certain things are restricted that used to work really, really well. And now we're kind of like, barely getting by with the pesticides that we can use. Bugs are building up a resistance, especially mealybugs. So that's one thing I was saying is if you almost see something that's got mealybug really bad, it's best to just pitch it because there's really not many things that are gonna get rid of it. I mean, I've heard of people cutting the plant, washing it with alcohol, you know, no mealybugs on that cutting, stick it in a brand new pot with brand new soil, and boy, those mealybugs will come back. And I'm like, how in the world does this happen? I don't understand it. So, you know, I always tell people, obviously, correct watering, correct light can prevent all of these things, you know, feeding your plants, keeping them healthy, just like we're keeping ourselves healthy to hopefully fight off any bugs that get, you know, us, as in, you know, colds or flus or whatever, you know, that's, that's one way you're going to help prevent those things. Um, I did also bring a little LED bulb, which I think is kind of necessary if you're wanting to grow certain house plants in certain parts of your house. This one can go into just a regular fixture. You know, if you have a cute little lamp on a table and you want to put an African violet underneath it, you can put one of these in the lamp and it'll grow. And I think, you know, then you could have some success with something that you thought you never could. You know, even if it's a pothos or a ZZ plant or, you know, adding one of these close by, it's really going to help it tremend tremendously, really, because this is going to have all the different colors of the lighting spectrum. So that's what you're looking at here is the blues and greens. That's what houseplants take in. 
which come from the sun. And, you know, like I said, there's tons of different types of lights out there. And I hate pointing to people towards Amazon, but I've bought some really cool plant lights from Amazon. And we do sell a number of them also. Um, I also brought um, a couple different types of fertilizer. This is a fertilizer for air plants in general. So all these little fun air plants that I was showing you earlier that you can just soak in water once a week. You can also spritz with a little um, mister fertilizer. So you can use that and team them with the air plants. Um, I also brought some Jack's Classic or yep, all purpose. So that's a good one for house plants. It does have a measure on there for house plants, but majority of house plants don't really need something super special. Doesn't have to be specific. You know, if it's an African violet, you could still feed it with this. It would be fine. I always like to tell people some fertilizer is better than nothing. And I know that in the fertilizer world, we like to complicate things with all these different colored bags for specific things, but fertilizer is fertilizer, people. Hello. Um, and an all purpose can almost feed anything, really. Well, it can feed anything. But, you know, what I do like to tell people, and I did not bring, is an acid loving fertilizer. So, you know, a lot of times if you see the yellowing of a plant, the acid will help. Um, a lot of tropicals are acid lovers. Gardenias are acid lovers. A lot of the stuff that you're going to have outside if you have, say, a tropical hibiscus every year or a diplodinia every year or, like I said, a gardenia, jasmine, all those are going to be acid lovers. It's going to help the pH in the soil be at a good level of what they like. But I just think this is a good fertilizer, not something that is like a miracle Row. I think miracle Row has added salt, which is not something that we necessarily want to add to our water. So I think there's other fertilizers out there that are a little bit better. Um, but you can also use, if you're repotting things, you can use Espoma products. So I don't know if a lot of people have heard about, I'm sure you guys have heard about holly tone and plant tone and all those things. There's a tone for every plant there is. There was even a palm tone for a while. There was a tone with the mycorrhiza in it, which also can be, you know, it can work in cahoots with the roots of a palm tree or a hibiscus tree or whatever you're planting. It can be mixed in the soil and used as a good fertilizer, organic fertilizer. So you can definitely use something like that. Sandy, um, we have several questions if you'd okay, like. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, one last thing before I stop, because I thought I just got this plan and I thought it was so cool. And I didn't really talk about it until I just saw it, but um, I had to bring it because I just, we were all going crazy over this plant when it came in, but this is called a, a string of fish hooks. And I know that people are into like the strings of things, string of turtles, string of hearts, string of pearls, but this is string of fish hooks and all of those other plants that I just mentioned, anything with string in the name, super popular right now. But I thought this one was gorgeous super silvery blue foliage and just a nice looking plant. So yeah, go ahead. We, let's do some questions. What is the chemical in your systematic control? Um, let me look here. I should probably know that off the top of my head. A medical bridge. I knew that. Pretty common. Medical bridge has been around for quite a while. Okay. And the next question, I bought several huge mums last year at a nursery, mm -hmm. but we so later found they were covered in tiny insects, gnats, question mark. Could mm -hmm. that granular spray product work on those outside? Um, I don't know if I would do the granular on mums. I would probably spray them with something. Um, you know, if it's in the soil, yeah, you could add a systemic, in cahoots with whatever you're spraying with, but you really want those bugs that are above ground to come in contact with the pesticide. So if you're, you know, coming into the nursery, you could plant, I mean, you could use a couple different things. You could probably get by, depending on what the insect is, you could probably get by with spraying something like Jack's um, dead bug, Captain Jack's dead bug. But, you know, there's also a lot of other um, products that we sell like I said, depending on what that 
bug would have been, you know, that'll take care of them. I know that the eight, it covers over a hundred different types of insects. So a lot of times the eight will cover majority of things. And like I said, you can get the hose in. So if you've got a lot of mums, hook it up to your hose, spray them all, get them really good, tops and bottoms of leaves, probably take care of those insects pretty easily. Okay, this one's slightly confusing. It's from Harold Blocker. Uh, mm -hmm. What house plant matters? I think the F goes in the next line. Family tree, can one find you for assistance in? Um, which family tree can you be consulted on house plants? And you're um, with Suburban. So. I'm with Suburban. So yeah, I mean, you can find me at Suburban on um, Prairie Star Parkway in Lenexa, which is right off of K7. But I'm sure, of course, anybody at Family Tree will be able to answer the exact same questions that I can answer in the tropical sure. section. But of course, yeah. you know, if you want to come see me, that's that's fine. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, any local nursery can uh, provide that kind of consultation. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would think so. I mean, I majority of the people, yeah, sometimes seem pretty young and not really interested to talk to people. And I been in the business and been in retail for quite a long time. So there's a lot of people that like to come to me for advice, but you know, you can seek somebody out and I'm sure find somebody that's pretty good. Shoot, they could even find you at Earl May. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, then uh, Grace Troy said, I have measured success with rubbing alcohol on a yep. few mealy bugs on yep. succulents. Yep, yep. yep. And, I, and I overwatered succulents and had those, so. Right. Yeah. Right. Rubbing alcohol works well. I've even, you know, there's a couple recipes online of, of, uh, rubbing alcohol and diluting it a little bit with Dawn dish soap, a couple mm -hmm. drops of Dawn dish soap, water and rubbing alcohol. It, it is something that will work. Um, you just have to be aware that there are root mealybugs and there are also mealybugs that can live, like I said, along the rims of the pots. And you got to be really aware of that because you might think, oh, yeah, I got them all. But then, you know, a couple of months down the road, you see some more cottony little things on the leaves. And you're like, what the heck? I thought I got all of these things. But they're there still. And or there's, you know, eggs somewhere that haven't hatched out yet that will eventually. So, you know, there's not a lot of um, chemicals out there that can penetrate the mealy bugs hard shell. So that's a lot of times the reason that they're so, you know, hard to control, but you know, that recipe with the alcohol, it does work and I've seen it work, but you got to stay on top of it and you got to make sure that you're really um, paying close attention to the plant, you know, tops and bottoms of leaves and every little crevice, because that's where they like to hide. Okay. Next question. Can you yep. let the African violet go dry? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you definitely can. And you want to see the top of the soil dry out for sure. I always like to tell people like this. We all know what chocolate looks like, right? I mean, if you don't like chocolate, then I don't trust you. Sorry. That's just the way it goes. But, <laughs> you know, there's probably other reasons that people can't be trusted. But if you don't like chocolate, that's one of them. So I always like to relate it to chocolate. Um, majority of plants, of course, like to go dry a little bit further down the pot than others. But you always want to see any plant, no matter what it is, look like milk chocolate on the top. So we all know the difference between milk chocolate and dark chocolate, right? What the looks are. And I always like to say, you know, when it starts to look like milk chocolate on the top, that's when you start to check it. So a lot of times with the African violet, if I see them dry on the top, then I just go ahead and sit them in water. And I think they're fine. You know, as long as you're not keeping the African violet in water 24 seven, then you're doing the right thing because, you know, if you say you pot it in a self-watering pot and, you know, the pot, so it's two pots, it's a pot, and I probably should have brought one, but I'm sure a majority of you guys can find one at your nursery, but it's a pot inside of a pot. And then the pot that's in the inside is clay that's not um, glazed, so it can absorb the moisture. Well, you can keep moisture in there all the time, but honestly, I feel like if you allow it to go away, then you're doing the plant a favor. If it's in nature, um, you know, nature, sometimes they're gonna have a drought. It's gonna happen. They're gonna have to survive in, you know, nature with nobody out there with their watering can watering them. 
So sometimes it's good to do that. You're going to make this the roots stronger by letting any plant go dry. Because the minute you let it go dry, what does a plant do? It, it shoots its roots out to try and find moisture. So you're doing it a favor by helping it find moisture, but then you just don't want it to go too long because that's when you get some damaging. So, you know, that finding that happy medium with anything is great. You know, a, a great tip that I learned a long time ago is when a plant needs water, you can't overwater it. So you could stand there with a hose for 10 minutes on something. If it's got a drain hole, all the excess is just going to come right out the bottom. What the difference is going to be with house plants, and what I like to explain to people is the duration of time is what is going to be different. So say I got something that's foliage versus something that is a cactus, this is going to need water every other week where the cactus is going to need water once a month. But I'm going to water this calathea and this cactus the same amount because the same size of pot. So whatever can fit in this pot, however much water can fit in this pot is how much water you can give it. Or you could, like I said, stick it under the sink and let the water drain forever. But as long as you're letting the difference of the duration and time happen, that's what's going to matter. So if it's a more foliage plant, more frequently. If it's a cactus, less frequently. Does that help? Yes. One yeah. more comment about mealybugs. Uh, alcohol on Q-tips will get individual colonies. Just dispose of badly infested plants. Yeah, I think it's best. I mean, sometimes it's hard to let go of things. If it's one plant and it's your grandma's and it's the only plant you've got and you want to give it away and you want to keep trying to control it, so be it. But just know that if you got multiple, then it can spread. So any other? Well, that concludes our uh, questions. Cool. No questions here, I don't think, either. Well, Sandy. That means I did good, right? When there's yes, no questions. Yes, thank you for an excellent <laughs> presentation. Oh, all right. I hope I did okay. I know this is the first time doing Zoom and I wish I could smile at you guys, but yeah, yeah this is the way we're protecting everybody. So that's right. Thanks for participating in today, today's advanced training. Um, so that is all for today. Yay. Thanks guys. Sure. All right. Woo.